The second of Beethoven's string quartets in published order is this very approachable G major work, considerably more genial in character than the F major quartet that opened, Opus 18. Like the first, it follows the standard four-movement plan with the first, third, and fourth movements in the tonic key of the whole. The slow second movement alone is anchored in a contrasting key, in this case the warmer-sounding subdominant, and it also includes the composition's most remarkable formal innovation, which we'll explore together when its time comes. The recording you'll hear is by the Emerson Quartet, part of a complete account of Beethoven's string quartets that has given me much joy over the years. Movement one is in sonata form, as expected, and the exposition is repeated. Since this is a major key work, the second group of themes is initially heard at the dominant pitch level and will be brought back in the primary key during the recapitulation, which represents the reconciliation that is the overall goal of sonata form. I want to say a few words about the first theme, which is a composite of several complementary ideas. Its first eight-bar paragraph is a very tidy, contrasting period whose consequent phrase will also play a role as the exposition's closing and, finally, the last thought of the movement. So, to describe the first paragraph in full, it begins with a heraldic quality antecedent phrase in two contrasting parts, answered by a short, sweet, self-assured phrase that returns the music to the tonic and finishes there. The theme's continuation also exhibits a commitment to the periodic principle, although the period is irregular and could be described as unbalanced, and the theme closes definitively on the tonic. This is, overall, a very classical approach to thematic writing. The modulating transition continues in the first theme's stop-and-go vein and includes a brief and completely harmless D minor cloudburst as it finds its way to its D major goal. This transitional material will receive quite a bit of attention during the development section, but is largely omitted during the recapitulation, where its position is occupied by a sort of second development section, a regular feature of Joseph Haydn's first movement writing. The second theme area, which includes a flirtation with the region's relative minor key, is actually a group of themes affording considerable contrast, and the exposition closes, as I mentioned earlier, with the return of the consequent phrase of the first paragraph of theme one, now set in the dominant key of the whole. The exposition is repeated, and if you'll pay careful attention to my running analysis, you'll see that I've redefined its final phrase as the beginning of the development situated four measures before the double bar. I believe this case will make itself if you're sympathetic to the possibility and also argues powerfully in favor of always observing exposition repeats as the function of the closing changes more often than one might imagine. Among the development's remarkable features are a sedate double fugue, driven by the Baroque-style dotted rhythms first heard during the first theme's opening phrase, and a heraldic retransition during which the cello proudly announces the first theme's antecedent phrase before the journey back home is quite done. This has always struck me as a humorous touch, and you can find a rough parallel in the first movement of the Eroica Symphony composed a few years later. On its return, the first theme is stated loudly and proudly, considerably enriched by imitative counterpoint, and once the non-modulating development section that follows has completed its work by circling back to the home key from a visit to the strikingly bright region of E major instead of modulating to the dominant as the transition had earlier, the recap is regular which is to say that all the material heard during the exposition is brought back intact, only set in the tonic key, not the dominant, and thus reconciled to the whole. A brief two-part coda lays the movement to rest quietly, waving goodbye with a final bow to the first theme's opening paragraph.
The ABA form second movement is the slow one, and its primary harmonic platform is the warmer subdominant key of the whole, C major. Its serene, hymn-like, somewhat rococo A section is set forth in broad paragraphs that suggest a more local ABA form construction, and exudes both affection and yearning. Its brief closing sets forth the primary motive of the B section, which affords the greatest possible contrast. The B section constitutes one of those Beethovenian innovations that soon garnered its composer a reputation, that of an artist whose individuality must be reckoned with. I'll say no more about it and will leave it to you to make your discoveries. The return of the A section is structurally regular, but newly festooned with a plethora of melodic ornament, and its closing, now extended as a coda, includes the darkening touches of borrowed minor subdominant chords, such as often lent Joseph Haydn's codas an air of gravitas and sometimes regret.
The scherzo movement returns us to the quartet's tonic key and its somewhat skittish main theme, clearly derived from the first movement's opening, is complemented by regular phrasing and harmonic closure. Its second strain is far more worked out than its first, a feature that we also saw in the first quartet, and is in fact a regular aspect of Beethoven's scherzo writing. The initially sturdy sounding trio is set in the subdominant key and includes a chord that I want to talk about just briefly for reasons that will become clear when we examine the finale. That chord is an augmented sixth chord and can be heard in measure five of the trio. Here you can see that the cello is playing an A-flat and the first violin an F-sharp. The interval between those two notes is the augmented sixth from which the chord takes its name. The viola and second violin are furnishing C's in two octaves, thus completing that version of this chord known as the Italian sixth. Now trace its resolution into the following measure. The cello and first violin resolve in opposite directions, both landing on the trio's dominant pitch, while the other two instruments resolve to the remaining two notes of the dominant chord. That is the usual resolution of this kind of chord, so its function could be said to be predominant. If you were to hear that augmented sixth chord in isolation, that is, shorn of the context that the music surrounding it furnishes, it would be indistinguishable from a dominant seventh chord, which would resolve a different way, since an augmented sixth sounds exactly like a minor seventh and the ear cannot see. It is the context that lends this chord its peculiar flavor. That's all I'm going to say about that for now, but do keep it in mind because Beethoven is going to have some fun with augmented sixth and dominant seventh chord types during the finale. Earlier, I described the trio as initially sturdy sounding, and in case you wondered about my use of initially, that will probably come clear as you hear the themes return embellished with an elaborate tripping counter melody and triplet rhythms.
For the final movement, Beethoven returns to the sonata template that served movement one, but in this case the exposition is not repeated. The themes are high-spirited, driven by an irresistible torrent of galloping eighth notes. The transition includes some vehement D minor music as in movement one, the second group has much contrast to offer, and the exposition closes in D major as expected. That closing also serves as a bridge to the development and could just as well have returned us to the beginning of the exposition because its final chord is a dominant seventh of G major. But instead of proceeding as the sound of that chord would lead us to expect, Beethoven heads into the development section by resolving that chord deceptively into the flat submediant, that is, E flat major. That deceptive motion is about to become a notable feature of this movement and you'll want to keep in mind what I said earlier about augmented sixth chords, which in isolation sound like dominant sevenths. The development is an ample one for so short a movement and eventually finds its way via C minor into C major for the first of two false recapitulations and a retransitional passage soon emerges from this, clearly bent on the return of the main theme in its proper key. That retransition's dominant prolongation is soon reinforced by an alternation with some Italian augmented sixth chords finally fleshed out to achieve that more robust allele known as the German sixth. Now, whenever I teach a course in analytical techniques, I always have my students identify the augmented sixth chords on their first pass through any music from the 18th or 19th century, because these are important hinge chords, often demarking large structural units within movements. That is their apparent function here, but Beethoven is about to toy with our expectations. Instead of resolving regularly to the dominant chord, which is, after all, being prolonged in this context, the composer resolves that misspelled German sixth as a dominant seventh, thus sending the music into an unexpected detour for a second false recap, now in the quartet's Neapolitan key. For me, this is the most delicious moment in Opus 18, number two, and it is very much like some of the harmonic surprises one finds in Beethoven's symphonic codas beginning with the Second Symphony. These irregular resolutions point the way to the extreme chromaticism of later 19th century composers such as Richard Wagner and, one might say, to a complete breakdown of tonal harmony during Arnold Schoenberg's time. If you want to point the index finger of accusation, you could say that the rot begins here but that will work only if you consider it rot. In any case, the recapitulation is entirely regular with the transition reworked so as to resist modulation and the long closing section ends analogously on a dominant seventh chord of C major. This one is resolved regularly, finally, but of course it lands us in the wrong key. The coda thus begins in the subdominant key but soon finds its way home for a riotous celebration and an afterglow of G major goodwill. Brothers and sisters, I often lament the fact that my analytical comments sound so dry in contrast to the music on which I'm trying to shed a little light. 
And this may simply be one more example of the maxim that talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Thank you. 